comienzo a esta actividad eh, que eh, yo voy a hablar en español, otro colega habla en español y va a haber inglés y español, así que les aviso para los que necesiten la traducción. Eh, la actividad está organizada por la Cátedra Regional UNESCO Mujer, Ciencia y Tecnología en América Latina, que está situada en Flaxo, en Argentina, y que es a su vez el punto focal de un programa global que se llama Gender Insight, que dirige mi colega Alice Abreu. Eh, el Gender Insight es género, ciencia, tecnología, innovación e ingeniería. Después les vamos a distribuir información, pero bueno, es para que sepan que estamos aquí, dos instituciones, dos, dos uh, iniciativas, convergiendo para eh, trabajar en un tema muy interesante, creo yo, que eh, lo tiene en el título eh, que se llama, eh, bueno, en inglés, Agents of Change, Gender Inclusion in Public Policy, eh, así que vamos a estar hablando de las políticas públicas, de cómo se incorpora, se integra las uh, ventajas, los inconvenientes, los obstáculos que enfrenta la integración del enfoque de género, la dimensión de género en las políticas públicas. Eh, y bueno, vamos a dar comienzo con la presentación de eh, Ernesto Fernández Polcuch. Voy a leer muy rápidamente quién es Ernesto, ustedes ya lo han escuchado seguramente en la mesa, en el plenario. Es, eh, Ernesto es especialista en ciencia, tecnología y políticas de innovación. Actualmente es el jefe de la sección de ciencia y, eh, y eh, políticas de ciencia y partnership, no sé cómo lo van, partnership, bueno, en, las, en el sector de ciencias naturales de UNESCO, y desde esa posición eh, lo que es importante es que coordina los programas globales, ciertos programas globales de UNESCO en ciencia, tecnología y políticas de innovación, ciencia y comunicación, género y STEM, eh, diplomacy y ciencia y diplomacy, eh, políticas de, que vinculan la ciencia, la política y la sociedad, e incluyendo el Observatorio Global de UNESCO en eh, instrumentos de política en ciencia, tecnología e innovación. Eh, también, ¿cuánto trabajo que tiene Ernesto? Eh, también la el, el, el coordinación del report de ciencia de UNESCO y el premio L'Oreal UNESCO para las mujeres en la, en, en la ciencia y el programa que él presentó hace un rato, el programa muy interesante, se llama el programa Saga, que ustedes seguramente han podido escuchar. Bueno, te damos la palabra, Ernesto. Gracias. Sí. Tengo para entretenerme. Gracias. Eh, bueno, brevemente la idea es eh, un poquito continuar a partir de la presentación de esta mañana hacia... Eh, a, Gracias. Empezando a ver un poco los resultados de la aplicación de esta metodología en cuanto a las políticas y los instrumentos de política de ciencia y tecnología que hay en América Latina relacionados con la eh, igualdad de género. Eh, acá cuento de vuelta lo que es Saga, que ya lo escucharon. Eh, estas eran los siete, básicamente, hechos más cortos, los siete objetivos que son los que estructuran la, el, las políticas que estábamos analizando o, o estructuran los objetivos en funciones de los cuales estuvimos tratando de identificar las políticas. Y lo que nosotros eh, hicimos fue eh, básicamente un, una encuesta de instrumentos de política generales en los países clasificar todos los instrumentos según eh, objetivo general y los que tienen eh, objetivo de género dentro de la, eh, de la clasificación del Gender Objective List, hacer un análisis de gap analysis, un análisis de, de, de faltantes, de brechas, y eh, luego mantener todos estos instrumentos en esta base de datos que estoy... Que está por acá la, la dirección, el sitio web, que es donde se pueden encontrar todas las, eh, en detalle las políticas y los instrumentos. ¿Y ¿A qué me refiero con políticas e instrumentos? Que van, instrumentos puede ser un fondo, puede ser un premio, puede ser 
una, es una aplicación, una llevar a la práctica lo que son las políticas como una cosa más general. Entonces, básicamente, lo que voy a presentar muy, muy en breve es para cada uno de los objetivos de política, qué países encontramos tuvieran algún instrumento eh, acorde con, eh, los, con esta clasificación. Entonces ustedes pueden ver que eh, las columnas son siete, o sea que está bien. Pueden ver que para, hay, una, hay una concentración de instrumentos de política en las, en las áreas de estereotipos, normas eh, a nivel y, eh, ¿cómo se dice? Eh, role modeling, todo esto a nivel de la sociedad en general, y también algunas, algunas en el área 4 que, que yo mencionaba hoy a la mañana, que es más, más precisa sobre la carrera de los científicos e ingenieros, hay menos instrumentos específicos, por lo menos dentro de las políticas de ciencia y tecnología, porque claro, esas son las que analizamos, no las de educación, sino las de ciencia y tecnología, eh, con respecto a eh, promover la vocación de, de, de científica y promover la educación en ciencias en las eh, niñas y adolescentes, tampoco hay mucho en cuanto a atraer y retener eh, mujeres en las carreras de educación superior y hay muy muy poco en lo, en lo demás para promover la dimensión de género en el contenido de la investigación, en la práctica de la investigación y en las agendas de investigación, solamente encontramos un instrumento, no encontramos nada respecto de promover la equidad de género en, eh, la, en como política explícita en eh, el diseño de políticas de ciencia y tecnología y tampoco tenemos mucho en cuanto a promover eh, en el género en el área de la eh, innovación y el emprendedurismo, palabra horrible, pero bueno, emprendedurismo, entrepreneurship. Eh, esto ustedes dirán, bueno, aquí solamente estamos los nombres de los países que tienen alguna actividad. Cuando uno entra un poquito más en detalle, los subpuntos de nuestra clasificación, se ve dónde se, se concentran las áreas de, donde hay más eh, instrumentos y donde hay menos. Eh, por ejemplo, hay muy poco, lo mencionaste vos hoy, Gloria, eh, en cuanto a eh, incorporar la perspectiva de género en actividades, de, por ejemplo, de museos de ciencia, centros de ciencia y otras actividades de promoción de la cultura científica. Eh, eso lo vimos claramente como vacante casi total. Eh, en cuanto al segundo objetivo, casi todo, todo se concentra en promover las vocaciones y hay menos en cuanto a, al contenido educacional, de, en cuanto a incorporar la perspectiva de género en el contenido educacional en primaria y secundaria eh, y estos, estos otros, el, eh, hasta el objetivo que, que fijamos, que tenemos como de promover el ba balance de género entre, entre maestros, entre docentes de, de ciencias, tampoco hay nada específico eh, en, en la región. Aunque bueno, eso se puede explicar probablemente por otros, por otros motivos. Eh, brevemente acá entonces ustedes pueden ver el tipo de análisis que hicimos y casi todo se termina concentrando en alguna, en alguna área y aparecen claramente las áreas de vacancia. Eh, en las, acá también, hay po pocas políticas de acceso a oportunidades en, el, en, el, en los lugares de trabajo hay, y hay pocas relacionadas con la modalidad y, y todas estas otras que ustedes bien pueden leer acá directamente. Entonces, por ejemplo, en, en el ítem en el 4, este de la, carrera, de, la, de la progresión en la carrera, realmente está bastante distribuido eh, y está concentrado en promover la igualdad de condiciones en, eh, en cuanto a condiciones laborales. Eh, bueno, en esto no hay prácticamente nada, en esto no hay nada, eh, y en entrepreneurship, bueno, fundamentalmente es una, una, un instrumento que... que adhiere a cuatro de estos eh, objetivos. Entonces, básicamente la, las conclusiones, si me permiten, es que, que se puede usar la metodología que estamos planteando para analizar los, los gaps, para ver dónde faltan políticas. No estamos usando, evaluando aquí la, 
el éxito de esas políticas ni el impacto de las políticas, estamos simplemente haciendo un recuento de políticas para entender hacia dónde los estados, esto es más, más bien una representación de la voluntad de los estados, de qué es lo que se proponen hacer más que del éxito que tienen haciéndolo, eh, eh, que se entienda. Eh, ahí en la base de datos se pueden encontrar ejemplos, eh, el análisis, bueno, que hay varios temas que ya les expliqué que, que están faltando, eh, y que hacen falta justamente más, in, más eh, estudios, y en, en particular en la medida en que terminemos de diseñar los indicadores eh, que acompañan este, este modelo, se podrá analizar de mayor medida, por lo menos si no ya la calidad o el impacto específicamente, por lo menos un proxy de ello, a través de monitorear cómo esas variables van cambiando y ver qué efecto uno le puede atribuir a cada una de estas políticas sobre esos indicadores. Entonces en ese sentido eh, es que esta clasificación puede usarse para articular eh, las políticas, los indicadores y el monitoreo. Entonces básicamente esas son las conclusiones. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias Ernesto, eh, yo creo que es una iniciativa muy interesante, muy auspiciosa y que va a necesitar, más allá de lo que ustedes hicieron, Ernesto estaba pensando la, la colaboración de los países, para, porque yo acabo de, de estar en la, en la sesión anterior donde aparecieron una cantidad de, de iniciativas en México que, este, bueno, yo tampoco, tampoco la conocía, no hice este estudio, pero creo que invita el, lo que ustedes hicieron a que, a que las organizaciones de mujeres, las redes, etcétera, eh, informen de, eh, de qué se está haciendo en sus países, ¿verdad? Bueno, son fotos. Exacto, pero bueno, será interesante esa, esa, esa comunicación. Bueno, tenemos ahora la presentación siguiente, que es de Alice Abreu, aquí a mi izquierda. Como les había mencionado, Alice es la directora de, de Gender Insight Global. Ella es profesora emérita de la Universidad Federal de Río de Janeiro en Brasil. Fue vicepresidenta de la, del Consejo Nacional de Investigación para el Desarrollo Científico y Tecnológico de Brasil. Directora de la Oficina de Educación, Ciencia y Tecnología de la OEA, la Organización de Estados Americanos y directora de la Oficina Regional de América Latina y el Caribe del Consejo Internacional de Ciencia, entre muchas otras actividades y, y roles que ha desempeñado, como todos los, los que están participando aquí, que no podría, me gustaría todo mi tiempo en contarles su currículum. Así que las dejamos a Alice. Ok, bueno, de nuevo muchas gracias por estar aquí, los saludo en español, agradezco a Gloria por haber uh, montado este panel tan interesante, but I think I'll make my presentation in English, it's a little bit easier and my Spanish will not be judged so harshly. Uh, so what I would like to do here is try to... Um, discuss a little bit more what I told you this morning. Brazil is one of the few countries, now they're increasingly so, where women are the majority of PhD students, the majority in every level of education. I would like to understand more or less why this is so. What has been the policy in Brazil that resulted in this and what we can learn for, from it? Hmm? Well, first of all, I think that Brazil has been focusing on capacity building for a long time. In the early 50s, they created two important agencies, CNPq, which is our National Research Council, like CONICET, CONICIT, etc., and CAPES, which is an agency that for training higher education personnel, teachers. Huh? And uh, the first, CNPK, aimed at financing individual researchers in their research grants. And the second sought to promote capacity among university teachers. Brazil thought at that time that university teachers had to have uh, 
uh, graduate training and especially PhD. And they wanted to really uh, go to a, a very high proportion of PhD teachers in, at their research universities, right? In the late 70s, another important uh, policy was that in spite of the, we were then under dictatorship, but strangely enough, although the military coerced very much the university undergraduate courses, they were totally in favor of a postgraduate, a graduate system. So Brazil development on university is a little bit stinted because uh, although our university during many years were uh, harshly persecuted and, uh, and so on, we had a graduate system that was put in place and that worked very well. So today uh, also uh, Brazil started investing heavily in s and it created the Min Ministry of Science and Technology in 1985, one of the first of the region. Many countries today in Latin America still don't have a Ministry of Science and Technology. I think there are five or seven countries in the region with a ministry. So there might be more now. But anyway, uh, Brazil was one of the pioneers in this. Huh? Uh, it also tried to invest heavily in science and technology. So today, Brazil has more than uh, 3,500 uh, 3, graduate courses, where almost 2,000 nowadays are PH, give PhD degrees. So Brazil in 1915, in 2015, graduated 15,000 PhDs a year. That's a lot. I think we are really in the forefront there. But amazingly, as I told you before, um, these PhD graduates since 2004 are mainly women. So how, how is this possible? In general, when you look at other experience, for women to get PhD degrees, it's a problem to be accepted in centers, to be able to finance it. So I was um, uh, thinking how this goes, and Brazil goes a little bit like this. The research universities that give the graduate courses are all public. We have another skewed system where 30% of our system are public universities, which are also the universities that concentrate research. And 70% of our university system are less qualified universities, private, paid. So the less, that don't do research very much because research is very expensive. You have to have laboratory infrastructure and so on. Huh? Um, so what I, what I would like to tell you a little bit is what I think resulted in this in very increased um, uh, female participation in, in research and science and technology. Because one of the um, strategies of the government was from the beginning to give fellowships and scholarships. But Brazil really transformed this in a very interesting system CNPK, for example, that finances individual uh, researchers, gives a scholarship from the second year of university, what they call the uh, in, in, uh, scientific initiation scholarship. But these students have to work under a, a teacher that has also MSc and PhD students. So he enters immediately a research group and a laboratory. Then uh, they have MSCs and PhDs scholarships. But interestingly enough, it's the manner that these scholarships are given. Because contrary to many other countries, it is not given by a centralized organism and a centralized national committee. Brazil has instituted 
that the graduate courses are, are the ones who receive the scholarships, not the individuals. So if you are a grade A center of excellence in physics and you have 20 PhD students a year, that course is allowed to have 20 scholarships a year, right? And the one who chooses who will get the scholarships is not Sani Piquet, but it's the course, right? So this means that this is a completely decentralized all over the country. Where? And the, in the very, uh, the undergraduate scholarships, the, the, the person who gets the quota is not the students, it's the teacher. So the teacher has to have a good research project. And he says, oh, I want to have seven students. And they judge and say, okay, you get five. So the one who chooses the five students to work with him is the, the teacher, not Sénipéqué or copies. This means that, uh, you see, if you concentrate decisions, it is much more prone to have um, bias, etc. If you decentralize it in this manner, you level the playing field because really women to, that uh, uh, they had to do an entrance examination for the PhD course. But if they got there, they got the scholarship. That's it, right? So I think this is something uh, that is interesting to think of, how a policy that was not a policy of gender, right, was a universal policy. Yeah? But as it leveled the playing field and made merit and decentralization, uh, an important element of that, resulted on these things. If you look here, you see that women are 56% of all the undergraduate scholarships in 2012, 53% of all scholarships uh, in MSCs, and 51% in PhDs. So CAPES has also uh, other kinds of scholarship, but the other thing I think it's worth mentioning is the sheer numbers. I mean, it was really a very intense. Uh, the policy was, we will give as much scholarships as we can, really. So there was 150,000 scholarships given in 2012. That's a lot. I mean, it really incentivates. Another, and I'll go back here, another thing I think also is worth uh, saying is that these courses are free because they come from public universities. They don't have graduate fees. They're not paid. So I think that also makes a difference. And this is a national policy that uh, education must be one of the uh, services of the government and of the state, right? So I'll finish very quickly because um, you see the MSC uh, titles uh, was inverted since 1997, I think. Uh, since then, it's the majority of women again, and the PhD since 2004. So if you have a leveled playing field, and a university policy that really, and as I told you before, 50% of our researchers are now women, although they are still concentrated in certain areas. Uh, but again, what I would like to show you is that when you go to another type of scholarship that is not decentralized, that is given by CNPK nationally in a much more competitive uh, type of, of um, um, analysis, uh, women immediately are in a very different situation. Uh, what Sayenipeka does, it's about 7,000 or 9,000 scholarships that for Brazil is very little, right? It is the cream of the researchers in Brazil. To enter this system means that you really reached seniority. And as you see, um, yeah, in the total, you have about 33% of women. But if you go to the 1A, which is the highest, it's 
23%, right? And how is this given? This is given by committees, area committees, right? Uh, so what you see is that evidently the gender balance on this committee is very skewed. In, uh, uh, this is, um, we don't have permanent data of this. This I looked in the data of the committees in 2009. We can do it every year. It was not done, but that year, engineering had 5% of women, right? Health science had 22%, right? So uh, the, the whole question of how you construct excellence in the, the, the research career, uh, you have to understand that you, if you don't consider gender and don't put a gender lens, you don't understand very well why uh, we, we are like we are. Thank you very much. Wendy. Uh, moment. Bueno, creo que es, es, tenemos la, la foto ¿no? que presentó Ernesto, eh, una, una per, primera foto, pero creo que empezamos a entender como eh, eh, desde un punto de vista histórico, ¿no? O sea, qué ha pasado históricamente y ciertas modalidades particulares que tienen en las políticas que permiten eh, lograr mayor igualdad o que la impiden, ¿no? Así que bueno, vamos a seguir ahora con Nancy Hopkins. Eh, Nancy Hopkins, eh, bueno, también tiene una larga trayectoria en estos temas. Eh, ella ha estado trabajando para promover las tecnologías de información y comunicación en África, básicamente, y en otras áreas en, desar de desar en desarrollo, con un énfasis particular en género al a lo largo de cuatro décadas. Fue jefa de investigación en el programa para las mujeres y el desarrollo de la Comisión para África de Naciones, la, de Naciones Unidas en Addis Adeba, Adaba, eh, la, the, the first in, ah, el primer programa internacional sobre mujeres y, y desarrollo en el mundo. Eh, pues, pues, eh, pues, posteriormente, ella lideró el programa ECA para promover las tecnologías de información para el desarrollo en África ha trabajado, eh, donde ya ella trabajó para establecer la iniciativa eh, africana sobre la sociedad de la información y esto es muy importante porque ya es célebre, eh, la Asociación para el Progreso de las Comunicaciones en el 2000 estableció una, una, un, un premio, una competencia, un premio anual que lleva su nombre, Nancy Hopkins. Así que bueno, le damos a Nancy la palabra. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, not surprisingly, I am going to choose to speak in English. <laughs> um, I am going to present the results, and some of them are very recent, of an assessment of the Gender and the Knowledge Society framework, which was done in four East African countries. And with regard to the topic of this session, I, I'd like to raise the question of the sufficiency of national policies on gender and science, technology, and innovation in achieving gender equality for, for women in the knowledge society. Um, the basic premise which is behind the gender equality in the knowledge society is that women, particularly in STEM statistics, um, do not tell the whole background of the story. You really need to know the backstory uh, of what women have to overcome in order to get there in, in the first place. And so that is what this framework tries to investigate. These four studies were done by four individuals and teams of young women researchers uh, working in Africa, in Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda. Just in case your geography is a little weak. <laughs> the, uh, can you point yeah. to the four? You can point there. Yeah, I think you have to, you have to point up there. 
they are four contiguous countries in East Africa. Ethiopia, then going south, Kenya, then going west, Uganda, and then tiny, tiny, Rwanda. And these countries are really not insignificant in terms of world population. Together they account for 200 million people. And among them is Ethiopia, which formerly was associated with famine and extreme poverty, but for the last 10 years has been growing at an annual GDP estimated variously from 7 to 10 percent a year, and is expected to be one of the most populated countries of the world by 2050. All of the countries, though, are very low income with GDPs ranging from 1,000 to 1,600 uh, dollars a year. Uh, Kenya has 44 million people and is the richest of the four with a GDP of $1,600 a year. Uganda, um, 40 million people, $1,400 a year. And Rwanda, that tiny, tiny country, but one of the highest density countries in the world, um, yeah, with a population of, no, forward, <laughs> of 11 million squeezed into that tiny area. Uh, what I would like to do first is uh, to put together the four studies and show what were some of the common points to them. All of them had good policy. All of them had uh, constitutions that declared the gender equality of men and women. All of them had national gender policies. All of them had various forms of affirmative action, but they often fell quite short in implementation. And the major reasons was that the national policy frequently deferred to either traditional law, customary religious law, uh, which uh, had very patriarchal roots to it, um, or uh, simply didn't have the means to implement the, the policy sufficiently. Uh, all of them shared very precarious health situations, albeit they are improving over the last decade. Gender-based violence was endemic, and it, it took many forms. Trafficking of girls, uh, compounded by reluctance of women to report any gender-based violence, because it was considered just simply a necessary or an inevitable part of society, and also lack of support for those who were victims of gender-based violence. Infectious diseases were very high in all of these countries, and with women having a higher rate of infectious diseases, generally uh, three or two times the rate of men. And this particularly includes HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. Many deaths from illegal abortions because in all of the countries, abortions were illegal, uh, at least highly limited. The positive part was that there was some uh, growing um, contraceptive use in the four countries which resulted in drops in fertility over the last decade or so. And they all shared a social status of patriarchal structures and very outdated gender stereotypes. Um, there were high rates of women's economic participation in all, but very few of the women were in salaried employment. So most of that economic participation was at lower levels and largely unpaid, great amounts of unpaid labor of women, and generally very large wage uh, gender gaps in, in all of the countries. Very big time use gaps. Of course, there are always time use gaps in every country between men and women, but, but these were of a greater magnitude in many areas where the average time use uh, of women in work was 15 to 19 hours, and, and men one half of that. And high disparities between urban and rural areas in gender equality, great disparities. But um, one particularly interesting indicator of that was 
uh, a lot of it was on the basis of low rates of electricity. And of course, women being the beneficiary in terms of reduction in workload uh, by the presence of electricity. And the electrification, the rural electrification rates in all four of these countries ranged between 5 and 10%. And women in general had low access to credit and loans, and few of them had title deeds for property. With regard to education, all of them had received had reached parity in primary education for girls and women. Secondary varied from country to country, with um, parity in Kenya. In Ethiopia, parity up to 10th grade when there is a school leaving exam and then there are possibilities of going into vocational. But still, um, the qualitative part of these studies found that girls were staying in school despite very uncomfortable situations. And uh, there were many cases reported of sexual harassment, and this is at the secondary level, from both students and teachers from mockery for their bodily functions, largely because of lack of sanitary facilities, beatings from male students, and suffering attacks going to and from school. At the tertiary level of education, no parity in any country. Uh, numbers much increased of women in higher education, but still very low for girls in STEM fields. Um, and the sexual harassment of secondary school continued, but unfortunately, a great deal of that sexual harassment at that level came from university teachers. Um, also generally shared among all these four countries were attitudes and trends towards women in science, a kind of a pattern that I call government promotes, society impedes. Uh, what was happening is Ethiopia put in a very positive science technology innovation policy with great encouragement for females. But what they did to get more young girls to go to uh, STEM fields and other scientific fields at university was to drop the admission standards to universities. The girls were not prepared, so the teachers came to the conclusion, I oh, see this just shows that the girls can't do it and no support was, pro was provided for these girls at the university, so they didn't do well. In, in other cases, uh, in Rwanda, another very positive um, STI tertiary education policy, but patriarchal attitudes there highly limited uh, entry of girls at the tertiary level uh, in science technology. And another factor is um, the constraining fact, impact of private universities. This is something which I think may be rather unique to developing Africa, than in the sense that there, there's a great insufficiency of spaces in public universities. They are highly competitive. The majority of spaces are taken by men. Girls are very anxious for higher education, so they tend to go to the private universities, which do have more flexible admission standards. But the private universities have very little funding. They have very little science. And so women are enrolled there, but they're enrolled in social sciences. With regard to technology, uh, lower rates of internet access, mobile phone ownership among women than men. Um, Kenya. And Rwanda were high on technological readiness, the other not so much, and very little data was available on level of computer skills by sex. Um, I, I realize that I have very little time, so I'm just going to give you some of the highlights of the individual countries. Rwanda, this tiny country, is a standout with superb policy, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of policy on gender and also gender and STI. They have the highest percentage of women parliamentarians in the world at 58%, high level of participation of women in decision making, in peace building, which is getting Rwanda back from its 1994 uh, genocide, but also um, a very low rate of gender inequality. This is using the 
ESG and the UNDP Gender Inequality Index. And of um, low-income countries, Rwanda is the only case in the world of a low-income country with a high rating on gender equality. But Rwanda still has a number of challenges. Most women work in agriculture, very uh, lowly paid. Particularly strong there are the patriarchal attitudes. Uh, women now 45% in university students, but actually 21% in engineering, which globally isn't that bad, <laughs> and a very low rate of rural electricity. Ethiopia, very positive in uh, the policy area in women in office. One of the great difficulties of women in Ethiopia has been female genital mutilation, which up until recently was practiced by some 90% of the population, both Christian and Muslim. Uh, it is illegal, but still widely practiced, but dropping in numbers. Um, there is progress in girls schooling, uh, still few women in formal sector employment, but uh, good policy to increase uh, women in the STEM fields. The challenges, though, are, are quite strong. The Constitution, which is very positive, gets frequently overrid by religious and customary laws that are, uh, impede women's situation with regard to divorce, marriage, inheritance. Uh, the, they have a civil society law which prevents women's advocacy groups with, foreign, with any foreign funding, which basically almost all groups have, to discuss women's rights or human rights. That's just one more second, but on Ethiopia. Um, very low female literacy rate, literacy rate overall 41% and very low um, information technology penetration rates um, on technological readiness almost towards the bottom uh, of the world. Um, Kenya, very interesting. Women are very big in what Kenya wants to become, the Silicon Savannah. And there you have leading women who are very much involved in science and technology, innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, a very interesting application called Ushahidi uh, was started by Julia Rotich there, uh, a woman named Isis Nyong'o, who happens to be the cousin of Lupita, <laughs> is the head of um, Google Africa, based in uh, Addis Ababa, I'm sorry, based in Nairobi. Akira Chicks is an organization of tech women who uh, devote an enormous amount of time to more training for girls in science and technology in slums, um, and a high percentage of women in high positions in the private sector. And yeah, the, yeah one, one more country, and I'll get <laughs> almost there. Um, Kenya's biggest problem, I, I think, in, with regard to policy is that there is no government agency which is charged with gender. There used to be a ministry, but in uh, 2008 they put it into labor security and social services and men, it doesn't even have a department. And also polygamy was re-legalized um, in the last year. One more country, just Uganda. Um, very um, conducive uh, atmosphere in political leadership. Uh, women in large numbers at the university among researchers in university leadership. And with regard to challenges, I think one of the greatest ones is it's the highest fertility rate in the world. It is still at 6.2 um, per, per women. Uh, and of course, the uh, loads that go with that uh, certainly determine people's, women's chances of, of getting into science, technology, and innovation. But just by conclusion, what I feel is looking at these four studies, uh, no single factor seems to be enough. You really need it all. You need the good policy, but the policy has to be implemented, and the implementation has to be followed with monitoring and evaluation. You need 
improvements in will women's health and freedom from gender-based violence. Otherwise, there's no possibility that they'll get through the education. You need status improvements, attitudinal changes about the abilities and roles of girls and women, and the diminishing customary traditional law. Women need voice, political p participation, obviously education, improved access to resources, um, more paid labor, equal pay, and of course, the sharing responsibility, equalizing multiple roles. It takes it all. Thank you, Thank you Nancy. Uh, es difícil, por tanta una presentación tan interesante, tener que hacerla tan rápido, pero seguramente tendremos tu presentación para, para difundirla. Así que bueno, vamos ahora a la última presentación de este panel, que eh, está a cargo de Sofía Hayer. Sofía Hayer es actualmente eh, la líder de investigación eh, sobre género e inclusión social de CGERAR, Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security Programs, as well, eh, del mismo modo que directora de WISAT, Women in Global Science and Technology. Ella ha sido, en verdad, una líder, una, una pionera, diría yo, en el análisis de en la investigación y en el análisis de políticas eh, a nivel global sobre igualdad de género en los temas relacionados con ciencia, tecnología, innovación a lo largo de 20 años. Eh, fue parte del Gender Advisory Board de la Comisión de UN sobre Ciencia y Tecnología para el Desarrollo, desde el 2014, eh, Senior Advisor de la Organización de Mujeres eh, de la OUS desde el 2009 al 2013, ha publicado muchos trabajos, entre ellos el capítulo sobre género del de último, eh, último informe de UNESCO sobre, global sobre ciencia eh, que... Bueno, que recomiendo leer fuertemente. Thank you very much, Gloria. Um, a very kind introduction. I will, um, I understand we're a little bit short of time, so I will move right into this presentation. Uh, and uh, I am going to be taking a slightly different approach where I am going to be looking at international climate policy, specifically around the UN. FCCC, which is the Convention on Climate Change, in relation to women's activities in natural resources management, agriculture, energy, um, and other kind of science and technology-based activities. Uh, to let you know what CCAPS is, this is an international research program in agricultural, climate, environmental, and social sciences, which focuses on um, the interactions in climate change and agriculture. Uh, a strategic collaboration between the CGIR system and Future Earth, and it's led by SEAT in Colombia um, and integrates research across the system. We have five regional focal points, um, and the research is integrated across the regions in Colombia. Uh, in Colombia, you can see here in Senegal, in Kenya, in India, and in Vietnam. The gender gap, what is the problem? Well, we know from research that is happening in all of these sectors and from what we know of women's situation in rural and developing world, women are less able to adapt to climate change. 79% of women in developing countries report agriculture as their primary economic activity, and yet across the board they have lower access to resources, land, inputs, technology, um, labor of families and so forth, and this load is increasing as men migrate to the urban areas for employment and as, in, in especially in certain areas, as disease takes its toll on family members. Uh, they have lower access, levels of access as well to information services across the board. Um, the World Bank has called, uh, has termed the gender productivity gap in that women in Farms, women run farms, women run um, enterprises across the world, tend to be smaller and less profitable, they use less technology, and they are located in less profitable sectors. And this is a very, very important um, problem in general, but 
particularly in relation to climate change, where women have this important role in these sectors. They have a lot to contribute in terms of knowledge, experience, indigenous knowledge, um, capacity. They are innovative, um, and yet they do not have the support, the resources, and the technologies that they need, not only to fulfill their roles and to produce what they need to produce for their families and communities in general, but as climate change makes it much more difficult um, to, uh, for agriculture, for deforestation, for energy use, uh, in addition to increasing disasters and diseases, it will put women that much further behind. And what we're concerned about is that the global gender inequality gap may actually increase and is likely to increase as a result of climate change if this situation isn't changed. We also have examples of how when women are supported to address um, the impacts of climate change and to adapt to the changes that climate change brings in, they're very keen to pick them up, they're very good at using them, um, and they're very creative in developing new innovations and responses. So the Obinju Women's Group in Kenya, uh, when, it, when they received training and improved irrigation for their crop production, reduced uh, pest Incident, incidents of pests, increased their production, increased their income, um, and formed um, community associations. So, in, so women do, as we all know, women do build a little with quite a, uh, build a lot, <laughs> excuse me, build a lot with actually quite a little. So what's the gender challenge in global climate policy? Well, global climate policy has basically ignored women for a long, long time. And it's changing, but very, very slowly. Uh, it's becoming gender inclusive over the long run, but there's still a long, long way to go. And a recent analysis that um, I did with uh, CCAF's WISAT, and which UNDP has had some role in, has found that even to date, climate change policies are not substantially taking into account gender differences, roles, and compa capacities, particularly in relation to the important climate change sectors that we all know about, transportation, energy, agriculture, and natural resources management. And it's uh, women's participation related to decision making at national and global levels is low. There is a very interesting analysis on gender and climate change and agricultural policies in Latin America, which was done by SEAT um, and which is available from the CCAF's website, which says that even though they, uh, there, there is representation of women in the agricultural policies, a recognition of their role, it does not translate to climate change. So what has the UNFCC done? Well, 50 decisions over the years support recognition and integration of gender. In 2001 was the first reference to women and gender in terms of promoting women's participation in decision making in the convention. And the goal is as a result also of the Lima work program on gender that all bodies reporting to the, commission, uh, to the convention or participating in the convention at national levels and other levels have a greater representation of women. That's changing a little. Uh, in 2009, the UNFCC formed the Women and, and Gender Constituency, which is an advocacy group made up of NGOs uh, and international women's groups. And the most recent agreement in Paris has made some very small steps forward uh, in terms of saying that actions by countries should take into account gender equality and women's empowerment and calls for gender, gender responsive actions in capacity building. However, that's about it. So there's no specific discussion of any of what we've been, I've just been discussing. There's no specific understanding of what should be done to support women uh, in the face of climate change. And in fact, you can see the references are, um, to illustrate this, I'm looking now at the INDCs, which were the reports submitted by countries before the Paris meeting called the in, in, uh, Intentional National de Nationally Determined Contributions. So it's, it, it's basically their pre-commitment on about what they will do about climate change. And now we're going through the phase of them developing the committed commitment to this. So, <laughs> so, we did an so we did an analysis of the INDC submitted before Paris, which is included actually in, a bro in an info note here I have here. Copies are available at the front. The, my PowerPoints have updated the numbers slightly. Uh, we did a, an updated analysis just after 
uh, December, which and a few more countries had contributed. But basically what we're seeing, let's see if I can stand up and look at this, is that references to women uh, in relation to sector, these sectors are greatest in return in terms of agriculture. However, there's like 15 references. However, we looked at 161 of these INDCs. Only 14 referred to women or gender in terms of agriculture. 35, I don't have it here, but 35 referred to women or gender in terms of vulnerability to impacts. But if we're looking at what women do, no real understanding. So we have 10, ref 10 countries made a reference to women, women's role in energy, seven women's role in health, which would be is extremely surprising, six in regards to environmental management, six in regards to women's role in disaster and risk reduction, five, three in terms of women's workload, and three in terms of the contribution that women make to economy and livelihoods. So it's nothing. It's nothing. And so this is a very, um, so despite this kind of sense that the UNFCC is, is starting to integrate gender, we see that at the national level, the recognition of this is very, very low. There were three countries um, referred to a gender and climate change action plan in, their, in this report, which was a national strategy or, and or policy related document. Um, about, we think about 10, the IUC, IUCN and others have been working with countries to develop them. We think about 10 have developed these strategies, but only three are actually referring to them in their national um, determined contribution. Then if we look at what is women's representation in the UNFCC bodies and what is the, how are they pr contributing in decision making. So here we go again. Whoops, oh, wrong button, sorry. Okay, so the, we'll start in the end here. Heads of party delegations to COP20, that was the year before. We have women made up 26% of the heads, men 74. They made up 36% of parties overall, so that's not too bad. If we look at the technology se sections, we see they make up 25% of the technology executive committee and 6% of the advisory board to the Climate Technology Center and Network. 25% of the Adaptation Committee, and, and most references in the INDCs to women were made in relation to either vulnerability or adaptation, and yet we still only have a quarter. And the Joint Implementation Advisory Committee has the largest representation at 40%. So many of these, many of these documents do identify gender as a cross-cutting policy priority, or they commit to mainstreaming gender. Again, about 30 or 40. Um, many of those, possibly even less, many of those only make a token reference to this at the very beginning of their preamble. Only 20, 20 parties make reference to, integration, to integrating gender into national climate change policy and strategy in a general way, saying gender is mainstreamed into our climate change policy. Gender is you know, a cross-cutting issue in our, and that's it. And the th gender and climate change action plans. All right, this is moving too fast here. Um, so it's not a it's not a pretty picture. It's it's not a good story. I think there needs to be a lot of work among women's groups and men's groups to to um, to call for change to demonstrate the need to be addressing these issues much more seriously. Um, you know the the UNFCC uh, in a previous. Um, panel, Lorena Aguilar made the point that the UNFCC is actually on, the only one of several environment-related UN conventions that does not have a real strong gender mainstreaming component. Even the gender climate funds do. Uh, the UNFCC makes to, needs to make a much stronger link to Rio Plus 20, the Beijing platform, CEDAW, e, um, and the Commission of Status of Women, uh, 55th session on participation in women uh, access and participation of women and girls, even this document um, does make a reference to climate change. And so there needs to be much more global policy coherence and connection. What are some of the possibilities? There are many uh, different national and globally uh, uh, placed mechanisms and structures for countries to plan their mitigation actions, plan their adaptation plans, plan their forestry and carbon reduction emission um, processes. 
Uh, there's the Global Climate Fund, the GEF, the Clean Development Mechanism, as well as regional mechanisms such as MEPAD, um, and I believe the EU, the AU, and, and so forth. Um, so these are all opportunities to really integrate gender and social issues into in a much more concrete, strategic way. There are many good examples, and these are three of them. Nigeria has a national to a toolkit for gender and climate change adaptation. Georgia is one of the only countries with a gender-sensitive um, mitigation action plan, which talks about making renewable, clean energy available in households for um, cooking and for heating. Uh, it's really a nice one as well. And then Peru has a gender and climate change action plan. Um, the, this is my presentation. I would just like to close by saying, in addition to this, that in the review of the INDCs, we found that overall 57 countries or so made references, any reference at all, to gender, uh, whether it's just women are included all the way to a much more detailed approach. None of those countries were from the developed world. No, they were not from Europe, they were not from North America, they were not from Australia or New Zealand. And so I think that shows an interesting glaring lack of attention to this issue in the developed world as well as well as, I think, a very um, technocratic approach, which needs to be changed if we're really going to bring, um, if we're really going to address climate change in a meaningful way. Thank you. Bueno. Eh, creo que ha sido un recorrido muy interesante de empezar a saber qué está pasando en, en América Latina, luego saber qué pasa en un país, pero no por lo que pasa en Brasil, sino por las condiciones del país, la historia, la, lo, lo estructural de un país que va a facilitar o que va a impulsar un tipo de política determinada y va a mantenerla, porque tiene que ver con la visión de, de Estado, digamos, y de país que tiene Brasil en este caso. También después hemos visto, eh, bueno, que puede haber, que, lo que decía Nancy, las políticas deben existir o es bueno que existan, pero eso no lo explica todo, no está ahí todos los factores de cambio que se necesitan para re, realmente llegar a lo que queremos que es una eh, situación de igualdad entre los géneros. Y creo que Sofía mostraba también otro tema interesante que es también la relación entre uh, las políticas de igualdad de género, pero también los intereses eh, que tienen distintos países y las prioridades que tienen distintos países en, en relación a ciertos temas críticos, como puede ser lo que se necesita para realmente a, afrontar o o resolver las cuestiones del cambio climático, o las consecuencias del cambio climático, y que predominan por sobre las, otro discurso, otra perspectiva, que es la perspectiva de derechos, la perspectiva de bienestar, etc. ¿no? Así que creo que hemos hecho un recorrido muy interesante. Bueno, da el tiempo para preguntas y para comentarios. Da. Eh, tenemos, eh, yo diría, ¿cuánto tenemos todavía? ¿Diez minutos? ¿Dos preguntas? Dos minutos. Bueno, vamos a hacer los cuatro. Entonces vamos a hacer cuatro minutos, así dos que preguntas. dos preguntas. Okay. ¿Ya? Okay. Hola, buenas tardes. Gracias por las intervenciones. Eh, yo tengo una pregunta para Ernesto sobre los indicadores que están ahorita haciendo. Eh, estos van a estar regionalizados, aunque las problemáticas son muy similares y si vemos por todas las exposiciones que ha habido durante el Gender Summit, que pues, llegamos a lo mismo, o sea, las brechas son muy parecidas entre todos los países, ya sea de Latinoamérica o en Europa, pero ¿va a haber un esfuerzo para regionalizar estos indicadores de acuerdo a las problemáticas de cada país? Bueno, gracias. Eh, en principio, lo que se está desarrollando son indicadores que eh, a priori puedan ser utilizados en todas las regiones justamente por la intención de garantizar como comparabilidad entre países de distintas regiones. 
pero claro, siempre con una mirada de que estén adaptados a las condiciones de los países básicamente de, en desarrollo. Entonces, lo que se va a hacer ahora es, después de finalizar el diseño, es hacer una implementación piloto para ver cómo funciona en distintas regiones y en todo caso si se ve que hay una necesidad se, se buscará bueno, corregir los problemas que, que, que tenga si hay un tema regional. Pero no, no tengo muy en claro que, cuál podría ser la, el, el problema regional ahí. Tendríamos que, que estudiarlo. Hello, so, sorry. So my name is Flora. I don't speak Spanish, so I hope the former question wasn't my question. Uh, but I had a question for Mrs. Uh, Brew. Um, so you showed very relevant results about the, the fact that when the decision is decentralized, you have a higher rate of women that are promoted or, or that gain scholarships. On the contrary, in the case of CNPQ, uh, the fact that it's all centralized completely decreases the proportion of women at higher ranks. So I had one first question was, Did you show those results to this institution, the CNPQ? Uh, if yes, how did they react? And if no, why didn't you do it? And the second question is, um, what alternative mode of uh, decision uh, of attribution of the prices would you propose to CNPQ in order to improve their process? Thank you. Yes, well, um, Uh, Brazil, for several reasons, has a very transparent thing. So this data is available at CNPq for everyone to see, so they must know it, right? So I don't think, I haven't been uh, looking at closely, CNPq has a gender policy, has some very interesting gender initiatives, like, for example, having an initiative showing young women uh, scientists and career incentives. It has a, a lovely booklet of pioneers. But really what I think would change, especially on that case, is changing the composition of the committees, having really a much more gendered, uh, uh, um, diversified committees. And that is a problem because it's not only CNPq that chooses the committee. The committee is voted by all the uh, graduate centers. And so you had to educate the centers, <laughs> right? It's a much wider thing also, right? So uh, yes, I think you're right. I think Brazil and CNPq should have one of these lovely programs we saw discussed yesterday and today. I don't think they have yet, but hopefully we'll get there sometime. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is all. <laughs> Thank you.